we stand at the edge of this new year. These 365 days in front of us. And instead of letting them blow by us, we look each of them in the eye. And one by one. We live them with intention. 365 days of sheer purpose. Each lived like it's the only day we've got. What if I live every day like no other day is owed to me? I'd reach out to my dad, make things right before it's too late. On my sister's birthday this year, I'd call instead of text. I would wake up in the morning and I would ask God what he wants me to do. I'd take those vacation days I still haven't used. Instead of inviting her to coffee, I'd invite her to church. Make myself get up early so I can watch cartoons with my kids. I'd give myself a break. I would take her to that park she's been wanting to go to, the one that's all the way across town. I'd say I love you, and I'd say it every day. On Thanksgiving, my table would be open to the whole neighborhood. Mother's Day would mean more than a $5 card. I'd let God have all the stuff weighing me down. I'd have more courage, because I'd have nothing to lose. I would take Jesus seriously when he asked us to feed the hungry. Serve the very least of these. Look after the sick. I'd be quicker to forgive because he forgave me. Living every moment with intention. Taking every purpose by the horns. Leaving nothing unsaid. Leaving nobody behind. Making every minute count. I would use every hour I had on this earth. To love God. To love others. One intentional day at a time. Well, isn't that a great video reminder? You know, this year as we come into the 20s, doesn't that sound weird? So we come, do you remember when you came into your 20s? It's like some of you are in your 20s, but anyway, but some of you are like, I don't remember the 20s. It's been that long ago. But you know, if we learn to live a moment at a time, to enjoy those moments, those days, those opportunities that God gives us, to not miss them, as we go through life, it's easy to go through life and go on cruise control. And one of the things we want to do every weekend when you come to church is remind you of what God word, God's Word says. Maybe reorient you to listening to Him instead of you or your worries or the world. The world will always try to make you angry or scared. Um, that's how they motivate us to buy stuff um, and so, uh, or to watch, watch their shows. And so I want to encourage you this year, you know, take those moments. So I went out of town over the holidays. My wife and I uh, went up to the mountains to big old Boone, North Carolina area. If you've been there, have you been to Boone? Anybody up there in that area? It's beautiful up there. And um, we stayed in a chalet. It was almost 70 degrees while we were there. It's crazy. By the way, it snowed there last night, just so you know. I think it almost snowed here last night. But um, not, that was a joke. Not really. So we went skiing, and I, on the way to the ski slope, I said to Kristen, I said, hey, um, you know, I haven't skied in 25 years. Maybe I should take a lesson. Now, I was not a bad skier in high school and college. I actually skied black diamonds. I hated them because they're just too much work, and I'm lazy. If you know me, I'm lazy. And uh, so, um, by the way, I'm having eye surgery this week, uh, uh, and we have an awesome eye doctor in our church, but he was out of town the day I went to the doctor. But anyway, so... Um, I can't see you. So if you think I'm looking at you today, I'm not. I, I think if I do this, I can see your face. It's good to, oh, Steve, I'm not sure I want to do that again. So we went, so we went to the mountain. And so we go to this ski slope at um, Sugar Mountain. And Sugar Mountain is a, is a great slope. We looked it up. We had been tubing the night before at a ski slope. And I, I said, I think I've been here skiing before. And they said, yes, we used to be, I think it was called Seven Devils before, they, which is a great name for church youth groups. And, um, and they said, but too many people broke their legs going down these ski slopes. So they changed it to uh, sledding and tubing, which is awesome, by the way. So that was a lot more fun for me because I didn't have to do anything. Uh, skiing is work. I don't know if you knew that. So we get our skis on. I was doing good. We kind of, I try to, you know, remember what I was doing. And, uh, and uh, so we, we talked to one of the guys who was there and we said, hey, where, where are the uh, beginner slopes? And he said, oh, it's over there. Take that lift. It'll take you. No signs, nothing. So we got to the top of the mountain and there's no beginner slope. We are at the, there is no way down. There is one way down, which is on skis or walking. I don't like to walk anywhere. So, 
So we're at the top of the map. We take a picture. It's the last. Ha- I should have brought the picture because it's the last happy picture of me for the day. <laughs> 25 years I haven't skied. Now, my wife skied like two years ago, three years ago, and, um, uh, and, and she's just good at everything. So, so we start down the mountain. She goes ahead of me, and she keeps turning around. Are you okay? I'm like, I'm fine. Just go. Cause partially because I was worried about just plowing into her. So I'm like, give me as much room. Now, one of the things you don't know is North Carolina compared to skiing out west is that there's about as much room as this aisle because it had been 70 degrees. So there was less and less snow. And there were 4 million snowboarders, half of whom were 4 and 5 years old. It was nuts. So I'm going down. And so I'm down the first hill and a kid cuts in front of me and I hit ice and I slide. And I kind of made an excuse for that one like, well, you know, that wasn't because you didn't know how to ski. That was because you hit ice. And then I went a little farther and it got really steep. And when it went really steep, I hit, I'm not even sure how I did it. I'm just going to be honest with you. I think I hit a pile of snow or it could be like when you trip on rug and you go, look at that bump and there's not really one there. I don't know. Here's all I know. I remember flying through the air over my skis. So, so skis are long. Just imagine how high I was. And I remember hitting the snow so hard that it knocked the wind out of me. You remember when you were a kid and it knocked the wind out of you and you couldn't get your breath? Now, as a kid, that terrified me. As a pastor, I thought, this is hilarious. It's going to make a great story on Sunday. I immediately started laughing as soon as I could breathe again and realized, man, I haven't had that happen in here. And the good news is all my, all my ribs are still intact. So I'm trying to get up, but I'm on the steep part of the slope. And it's been a long time since I even figured out how to get my skis back on. So I'm on the slope. I'm trying to get my skis. Now, I should have. In hindsight, I should have gone to the side. But there were people everywhere. So it didn't matter where you were. I'm in the middle. I get my, finally find my ski. I pull it towards me. I get my boot in. I start to get up. And a little kid <laughs> hits me rams into me. The board hits my keister. His body hits my kidney. He goes, he goes flying. It was like a a movie. Like he was like, I think if you could have seen it in slow-mo, it would have been like, no, upside down. He's now laying next to me here. And of course he immediately starts crying. His father comes up and does what a typical dad would do, which is get up. You're fine. You know, And so later I said to my wife, do you think I heard him? She goes, no, no, no. You're like Baymax. You're soft and fluffy. He probably just bounced right (laughs) off of you. I'm not sure how to take that. Now, here's the good news. I only fell two more times on that run. That run, by the way, was an intermediate. It was a mile long with several pretty steep drops. And I I only fell four times total, which I thought was good. I didn't fall the rest of the day. I was very proud of myself. But let me tell you the worst part of this. Now, I'm a person, I go to the gym uh, about five times a week, early in the morning. I get up at 4.20 every day, Monday through Friday. I go to the gym. I'm at the gym before and out of the gym before most of you are out of bed. But I bring water with me. And I bring water with me because I'm thirsty all the time. Well, I'm halfway down this one mile ski slope and I thought I was going to die. The snow starts looking good and it's been sitting there for a month. And I'm thinking, I, you know, and I was kind of glad when I fell, I got some snow in my mouth. I was like, mm, oh, tasty. Anyway, and I mean, I was dying of thirst. All I could think about was water. And I started thinking, you know, back in the time of Christ, water was not an easy thing to get. Now we just get a bottle of water. We go to our tap. We turn it on. But in most places, you had to leave your home and go to the middle of the city or outside the city gates. And you had to bring a bucket or some way to get the water and a rope. And then you had to bring jars and you'd have to carry it back. Maybe you'd have something on your shoulders. And still many places in the world still do that. Today, we're going to start looking at a city that did not have to do that at all. It was the city of Rome. See, the Romans, years before Christ, brought an aqueduct into Rome from water from outside the city, pure, wonderful water. And at the peak, the Romans had 300 million gallons of water coming into Rome every day. By the way, has anybody here been to Rome before? You've been to Rome? Still fountains there? Some of the fountains uh, uh, come from the original aqueduct. It's amazing. Uh, all the things that, that are there. But one of the things about Rome is if you were there, 
there, you would always, it would be a total change from anywhere else in the world. If you lived on a farm, if you lived in a normal city, water was not plentiful. But in Rome, water flowed. They not only had water, they had sewage, which is incredible for that time. And so the Romans, if you were listening to the book of Romans being read, let me just show you. So the book of Romans may have been read even outside of this building. This building is still there, and uh, uh, it was built and rebuilt, and I think we have a picture. You know what this is? What's this called? Do you know? The Parthenon. And so you've probably seen something similar in America. How many of you have ever been to the Capitol building? Anybody been to the Capitol building? All right, let me show you the inside of the Parthenon. Does that look a little familiar? So, so our founding fathers basically designed what's in Washington, D.C. based on this ancient building. Here's what's really cool. The book of Romans was most likely read right outside that building where the philosophers and the scholars and the Stoics would read their works and would discuss things. And so Paul writes to this early group of Christians in Rome. Before he ever got to go to Rome, he wrote to them. And of course, we know later Paul died in Rome. But at this time, he was longing to go to Rome. And so as we look at this book, I, I, I hope that you'll kind of in your mind have this setting of where this would be read and what it was like to be a Christian that lived in Rome and walked through these amazing buildings. And they had, you know, of course, gods everywhere. And then it wasn't too many years later that Rome actually became a Christian city. And even the emperors became Christians and Christian, Christianity became the law of the land. And as we look at Romans, you're going to see a lot of things in there. People have said that Rome, Romans is the top book in Christianity. You could read just the book of Romans and figure out what it means to be a Christian. But I also know this, it's easy for us to get off track in life. It's easy for us to, to lose our direction. And if you're like me, it's because you can't see. Or some of us are just directionally challenged. Anybody in here directionally challenged? Anybody in here have somebody sitting next to them that won't admit they're directionally challenged? All right, there we go. So we're going to look at three key truths of new directions. And I'm hoping this year to set a new direction for your life. Here's number one. Faith leads to obedience. Now, this is totally opposite of every other religion. I want to show you a picture. This is fake fruit. It looks pretty good. Here's the problem. It looks too good. Why? Because it's fake. So many people, even in Christianity, if they're not careful, they just pretend. It's not real fruit. What is real fruit? Real fruit comes from trees and bushes. This came from an apple tree. Nobody had to go up to the apple tree and say, you better have some apples. Nobody had to go up to this tangerine, tangelo, tangy something. Now, it's not perfect fruit. But it's fruit. Listen to what Paul says here. Paul, chapter 1, a servant of Christ Jesus. By the way, he calls himself a servant. Paul was trained by a guy named Gamaliel, who to this day is known as the, uh, the founder of the, or the final oral law person for the Jewish faith. If you talk to a rabbi, he knows the name of Paul's teacher. Paul was up there. Paul was a Roman citizen. Paul was well-educated. Paul was the head of his religious union, as we would call it. And yet, what does he say as a Christian now? A servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God. By the way, then it says, the gospel he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures regarding his son, who as to his earthly life was a descendant of David. So he's reminding them, hey, Jesus' lineage was from David, just like it prophesied in the Old Testament. By the way, the word gospel literally means good news. It just means good news. Most Christians, you wouldn't think by their face, that's true. Some of you, even this morning, that I can barely see, don't know that. And then it says, and who through the spirit of holiness, and it's talking about the Holy Spirit, was appointed the Son of God in power by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. Now this is a huge, this whole sentence is a huge crazy sentence. So you remember Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus looked at people and said, if you want to know God, you have to know me. 
That is either a crazy person claiming to be something they're not, or Jesus was who he said he was. And Paul comes and says, this is who Jesus is. And then he continues, through him we receive grace and apostleship to call all the Gentiles through or to the, listen to this, to the obedience that comes through faith. Every religion in the world says, you want to get to God, earn it. You want to get to God, do these things. And the truth is, if you're not careful as a Christian, you'll go back to that. You'll think, well, I didn't, I didn't pray today, so God doesn't love me as much as he loved me yesterday. Or if I want to get close to God, I better go to church. Oh, pastor, would you pray for me? Because you're closer to God than me. Nay, nay. Because of our relationship with Christ, you're just as close to God to me. I don't have a hotline. We all do. It's awesome. And it says this. So obedience that comes through faith. Why? So we believe first. And then what happens? As he fills us with our spirit, then we walk in obedience. And I'm going to talk about this in just a minute. And then it continues. For his namesake. And you also are among those Gentiles who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. And then he says to all in Rome. You can hear the water running, can't you? To all, by the way, Rome smelled better. You ever think about that? I mean, you, I helped somebody move yesterday. Can I tell you there's church members in our church today that are probably have a different view of the pastor than they had a couple of days ago? Man, pastor can sweat. Unbelievable. What's that smell? Oh, it's a pastor, right? Imagine never having baths. Imagine water being so precious that you would never put it on your body. So you walked into Rome and they were bathing all the time. Like These people smell good. So he says, to all in Rome, you good smelling people. Best smelling Christians on the planet. Sorry, he didn't say that. I just think of that. It's not really in here. To all in Rome who are loved by God and called to be, listen to this, his holy people. You know what holy means? Holy, just, it, we think of holy like a crazy person, right? Like a holy roller. They're jumping over the pews. Or a holy person, like somebody super spiritual. No, no. Holy simply means set apart for God. Holy purpose. That's what it means. And then he says, grace and peace to you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. By the way, I could take that one passage and teach on it for an hour, but we're not going to. Religion says, obey, and you'll earn salvation. Christianity says, put your faith in him, and you'll become something different. Here's what happens. When you accept Christ, and you give your life to him, and you surrender, because you know, listen, I've never had to convince someone that they're imperfect. Right? You know, they, they, they had these questions in seminary, like, do you know you're a sinner? I've never had any, well, I had one guy, I gotta say, I had one guy in my 25 years of full-time ministry, I had one guy say, I don't sin. And I thought, I'm gonna go ask your wife. That's all I could think. But actually, I knew the guy and he sinned. But anyway, so, but, but here's the cool thing. So positionally, when you give your life to Christ, he takes your sin. Practically, you still drive on I-4 on occasion. And you still get up sometimes grumpy, right? And, and you still say things and you think, why did I say that? You still do things and you think, oh, I wish I didn't do stuff like that, right? And so, and so positionally you're righteous. Practically you don't always live that way, right? But what are we doing? Through faith we're working towards obedience. We're allowing his spirit to work in us. And, and let me challenge you with this. If you have no conscience... If you pursue sin and you don't care, my question is, are you really a Christian? Can you really be a follower of Christ and not follow him? So here's two questions. Have I trusted Christ by faith? And then secondly, am I walking in obedience? So what does walking in obedience look like? It doesn't mean perfection. Remember, you are perfect positionally when you give your life to Christ, but you still fail. So what does that mean? So when you fail and fall, you say, God, forgive me for being here. Forgive my sin. I repent. And by the way, all repent means is just turning around, looking at things differently and saying, God, I'm sorry that I said this thing or thought this thing. We never struggle with that, right? I ask you to forgive me. And that helps us to walk in obedience. 
And the hope is, and the goal is, as the Holy Spirit works in our life, we're a little better. We're a little farther along than we were not long ago. By the way, you don't have to. You can tell God no. You will be miserable, but you can do it. Number two, we're saved by grace through faith, not works. Listen, if you don't hear anything else today, hear this point, and then you can go back to sleep. I want to make this simple for you, as simple as I can. All right? Anybody in here love to swim? You love to swim. Anybody in here ever have to swim? You were forced to swim. Anybody ever fallen out of a boat here? And you were suddenly, okay. Anybody know somebody who swum before? They have a friend. This, we don't have any swimmers in our church, apparently. We got about three. So anyway, last night was the same way. I'm like, has anybody ever seen somebody swim? You ever watch the Olympics? It's, okay. All right. Best swimmer in the world. Maybe swims across the English Channel. What is that, like 30 miles or something? 10 million miles? I have no idea. I should have looked that one up. All right. So... So here's the thing. Let's suppose we got a big plane and we flew everybody out to California. And we got on the beach in California. And I said, listen, guys, we're going to take a swim today. And if you want to survive, you've got to make it to Hawaii. Go. So we take off and I'm about 100 yards offshore and a shark sees me and says, man, that looks like Baymax snack. Done. So if you get a little farther, you do great, right? You, you get farther. Patty's out there, and she gets so far. She's like 100 miles out. She's still going. She's got that back float down. She's going. But you know what? She is never going to make it the 2,000. Let me give you exact numbers. 2,471 miles to Hawaii. Never could make it. But let's suppose somebody comes by in a boat and says, you want to ride to Hawaii? And they pull you on the boat. You don't then sit on the boat and go, unless you're crazy. Here's the deal. You cannot make it to God on your own. I don't care how perfect you are. Hey, if you haven't figured it out, even the Pope messed up this week. Don't tell anybody. He had to confess sin. You know what that makes him? Human. It's okay. The Bible says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Everybody blows it. But what do we do? We don't. We get in the boat. And we admit, Jesus, I need you. Jesus, I love you. Jesus, I, I can't make it on my own. And I surrender to you. And what do we do? We get in the boat. Now, when you're in the boat, you're grateful and you're thankful. But here's the deal. You're saved by grace, not by what you do. So why do we do anything good? Because we recognize what's been done for us. Listen to what Paul says. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Remember, that means good news. Because it's the power of God that brings salvation, get in the boat, to everyone who believes. First to the Jew, then to the Gentile. For in the gospel, the righteousness of me, the righteousness of God is revealed. A righteousness that is by works. No, a righteousness that is by faith. This is what sets Christianity apart from every other religion. It's not based on our works. We surrender to him. From first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. That's from Habakkuk, from the Old Testament. The righteous will live by faith. So it's not a new thing. Some people say, oh, well, the Old Testament was works and the New Testament, no, no. It was always by faith. The Passover and the, and the sacrifices that were made in the temple were representations of what was to come. They were looking forward to the Messiah and that was their faith put into action. So here's a question. Do I believe in faith that I've been made righteous? That's positional, Remember? Practically, I know we got a long way to go. I was driving this morning and some guy was in the left lane and something went through my mind that shouldn't have gone through my mind. And I realized, oh, I'm human. If I could just bump him, that would be. I was, I was thinking maybe I should get a sticker that said, if you're in the left lane and that's where you think you should drive, I don't like you. <laughs> See how sinful I am? Even your pastor needs Jesus, doesn't he? Do I believe by faith I've been made righteous? And here's what's awesome. I say to God, God, thank you that you made me righteous. Not because I earned it. Not because I deserved it. Not because I did some good things. Not because I, I did another thing. By the way, sometimes when we think, oh, if I do this thing, it's going to make me closer to God. It's like jumping out of the boat and trying to swim again. 
If I pray enough, then maybe I'll be more spiritual. And Jesus is like, get in the boat. You can pray in the boat. You don't have to, you don't have to light a candle outside the boat. Get in the boat. Maybe if I give some money, I'll be closer to God. No, no. That, I, listen, I would love to manipulate you and make you feel guilty because that's so much easier to motivate people. It's true. That's why pastors use guilt and manipulation because it's easy. When we understand by faith we've been given, what happens? It makes us want to obey because we realize all we've been given. We're in the boat. We're not swimming anymore. You don't have to be miserable anymore, walking in guilt and condemnation. You know that he's made you righteous. Even when you blow it and you think about the driver in front of you. By the way, I hope it wasn't somebody that goes here to church. Not that that would make any difference, like it's not a human. Number three, worshiping God in truth changes direction. Your beliefs change everything. Let me show you a picture. This was the map that Columbus had. Scholars say that Columbus didn't really, and even in his time, they didn't necessarily believe you were going to fall off the earth. They just thought you were going to go round and round the edge. By the way, this was like six by four. That's a big old, I mean, how do you even unroll that on a boat? They were a little off, weren't they? they did, by the way, they didn't like open space, so they wouldn't draw it. That's why it looks like there's just lakes here and there. So he thought he was coming to India. Even when he got here, he thought he was. By the way, when they were on the way here, they were almost here. They ran into something called Sargasso Sea. If you ever seen that brown stuff on the beach? When they did, his men thought, we've come to the end. They, tried, they wanted to mutiny. The trade wind stopped. You know what Columbus did? He started having them row. Give them something to do. He said immediately their attitude improved. By the way, some of us just need to start rolling a little bit. Dude. Go to Publix, whatever. The truth sets you free. Many people walk in bondage because they don't know the truth. And even as Christians, if we're not careful, we'll believe lies. That's why we have to go back to God's word. That's why the book of Romans is so great. Paul says this, they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served created things rather than the creator. Time out. This is not only talking about idols and other things. It's talking about they serve themselves. They tried to meet their own desires all the time. They tried to just do what felt good to them. And then he says, who is ever praised, amen. And they said, furthermore, they did not think it was worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God. So God gave them over to a depraved mind. That's why they don't feel guilty anymore for anything that they do. Do you know anybody like that? Filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity. They're full. Now listen, we love to look at this list and pick things and go, yeah, that person's like this. But let me read this list to you slowly. They're full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. I wish malice was not there. Because I was doing pretty good till we got to malice. You know what malice means? It means not good intentions. You ever say the right thing, but you don't mean it? Malice. And then it continues. They're gossips. Oh, you've never gossiped. You're in church. You don't gossip. We don't talk about anybody, right? They're gossips, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, and boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. How many of you were great teenagers? Yeah, we don't like you that much. No, I'm just kidding. You're still a great person. My mom would tell you I was a great teenager. That's because she didn't follow me around. Although they, they, excuse me, they have no understanding, no fidelity, no love, no mercy. Although they know God's righteous decree and those who do such things deserve death, they continue to do those things, but approve of those who practice them. Not only do they do what's wrong, they pull other people into it. Not only do they get drunk every night, they say, come get drunk with me. Come follow me in sin. Oh, you don't have to worry about that. You don't have a choice of how you feel, so just go with your feelings. They pull other people in. So let me ask you the final question today. Am I worshiping God with my life? And is there any sin I need to confess to God? As we start on this journey through the book of Romans and we talk about this idea of new directions, my prayer is that every week you'll have a little more truth. Every week you'll see the map more clearly and you'll know the direction God has for you. Maybe each week there's one thought that you've always had and you'll identify it so that as you're going through your week, oh, you mean I messed up and God still loves me just as much? And it'll change how you live 
as you receive the truth. If you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, we want to give you an opportunity every week. We don't do a formal invitation where people come down the aisle, but I'll be here after the service. And so after our time of offering, if you need to pray or if you're online, you can send me a note and you want to talk about what it means to be a Christian, I'd be glad to talk to you about what it means to surrender your life, surrender your sin, surrender your mess-ups to God, and to receive God's forgiveness through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. If you want to do that today, I'd be glad to talk to you. If you're here today, my prayer for you is that there was one thing that I said that you said, huh, I hadn't really been applying that. And that you'd begin this week. Maybe you'll write that down. Maybe you'll put it in your phone. Maybe you'll text yourself. Just to remind yourself, this is a truth that I need. Let's go to Lord in prayer today. Father, thank you for your word and your power. I thank you that we can take our, our supper, your supper together to remind us of the forgiveness you've given us. And Lord, I know there's folks here today that are walking in condemnation. They're walking in guilt. Lord, when all they need to do is just confess and make things right with you. And you said we can walk in freedom. Lord, I thank you that you said it's the truth that'll make you free. I pray we could walk in your truth. Help us to learn your truth in these next few weeks as we read your word and spend time in it. Set us free, Lord. Set us free from ourselves. Set us free from our bondage. Set us free from our fears and our anger and our sin. And help us to just sit in your presence. Lord, to not keep trying to swim, but to surrender ourselves and get on the boat with you, knowing that you've given us all righteousness. We thank you for that. Lord, bless each one today that's here. In Jesus' name, amen.